Arts. Uh, we are known for uh, producing films about pivotal movements and moments in the US, uh, particularly related to the African-American experience. We also have a number of different programs that support emerging filmmakers of color across the country from all uh, BIPOC communities. And we also carry out impact and engagement work that center communities of color as a primary audiences for nonfiction cinema. Uh, before I move on and talk about today's event uh, and the conversation we have lined up, I wanna stop and do a land acknowledgement. I am joining you all from the Bronx, New York, uh, where I was raised, uh, but this is also the land of the Lenape people. Um, and I, so I wanna welcome everyone in the chat to uh, feel free to let us know where you're joining us from and then acknowledge the indigenous uh, folks that, uh, whose land you're calling in from. Uh, and we do this because we believe we need a constant reminder of the fact that we are on colonized lands, uh, that we need to acknowledge the original peoples of the lands that we're uh, living on, we need to say their names, connect, and figure out how to be in active solidarity with Native and Indigenous folks wherever we are and whatever we do. Um, so that's an invitation uh, to share and to connect and to, to move into active solidarity in that way. Uh, now I will say a word about the series. Uh, Beyond Resilience is an event and screenings uh, series that we will be running throughout the summer, every Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and we decided to launch this initiative in light of the fact that as we're seeing in this moment, every single industry and every single sector in the United States is complicit in perpetuating white supremacy. Uh, and the, document, the documentary industry is no exception. So our hope with this series is that it provides a space for deeply honest and uncomfortable conversations that are necessary in order to bring about structural concrete change. Um, and we believe that that needs to happen with uh, folks from directly impacted communities at the helm. Uh, we do not need to be spoken about or spoken for. Uh, we need to be in conversation with each other. Right, um, and so uh, with that, today we have a terrific lineup. Um, and I do want to, before I introduce our moderator, I do want to uh, say today is Friday, June 12th, right? Whatever day, whatever that is into the pandemic. And uh, I believe it's day 16 or 17 into the uprising, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so I just also want to take a moment to lift up the fact that we all have a role to play in this moment. Uh, and uh, part of that is becoming educated on what we can be doing. Uh, and one of the things that we want to uh, shift your attention to is that we'd like to encourage everyone to remember to uh, remain connected and follow what is happening in Minneapolis. Um, as the news cycle moves on, it's important to lift up the community and the organizers from that city whose courage cataly catalyzed this current moment. Um, I also want to encourage everyone to connect with the call to actions issued by our folks in Louisville, Kentucky, who are still trying to bring the murderers of Breonna Taylor to justice. I uh, suggest that you look up Black Lives Matter Louisville, listen to Black organizers, follow their lead in your local communities and support their work. Uh, and so with that, now it is my pleasure to introduce you to our moderator, Carrie Lozano. Carrie is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and journalist. She is currently the director of the International Documentary Association's Enterprise Documentary and Pierre Lorenz Funds. And in addition, she is a lecturer at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much, Loida, and thank you for uh, to Firelight and to the full staff for hosting this series. I watched last week and uh, it was a really deep and incredible conversation. So even though we can't be together, I feel like we are building community in this moment. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Ohlone people in Northern California, but I also want to take this moment to just acknowledge um, the Navajo Nation, which is being so disproportionately affected uh, by COVID um, in addition to other systemic issues and oppressions. And so uh, we stand in solidarity um, and our hearts are with them. Um, so this is a 
really important discussion to me personally, and I think to all of us um, on this call about what are the ethical standards that we as people of color, filmmakers of color need to hold ourselves to, um, and how do we do our work in this moment and care for our communities, not just our crew, not just um, our subjects, but also our communities, and how do we reconcile all of the conflicting things that are happening. Um, but I wanted to just set a quick frame for that, and I'm sorry if I look down, I have all this paper in front of me and I, do, I don't want to miss anything. Um, um, I want to set a frame for what's happened over the last few months. So in a little over three months, 115,000 people in the U.S. died from COVID that we know of. A disproportionate number of those are black and brown people. Since the horrific death of George Floyd on May 25th, two and a half weeks ago, um, there have been hundreds of protests across the country. And I'd love to just show a map of this um, so you can see what, what this looks like. So I think this was updated on June 11th. And we can leave this up for a few minutes, Nicole, as I just go through what else is happening. When I saw that map, I, I was kind of astounded to really think about the sustained movement. And the filmmakers we're talking to today um, all played different roles in kind of um, following these movements through time. They didn't just happen overnight. But I just wanted to, to frame a couple other things that have happened in two and a half weeks, and then we're gonna get started. Um, so we've had this massive uprising across the country, across the globe. Racist monuments have been toppled. NASCAR has banned the Confederate flag. Minneapolis is seeking to dismantle and defund its current police department. The long-running series Cops has been canceled. And no-knock warrants, the likes of which killed Breonna Taylor and many others, have been banned in Louisville, Kentucky. So I hope that's just a beginning. That's a lot in two and a half weeks. So I'm, I'm hopeful, even though there's a lot to be worried about too. Because unlike uh, previous decades, it's become increasingly dangerous to be a journalist in this country, to be a filmmaker in this country, whether it's COVID, whether it's um, a fear of brutality, uh, whether it's fear of arrest, um, whether it's um, just oppression um, and being maligned publicly, um, those all, pose challenges to our work and it's unprecedented. So thank you, Nicole. With that, um, I really am excited to introduce our first guest, Brittany Farrell. And Brittany, you can go ahead and come on. There we go. Hi, Brittany. Um, and I think you're muted. Brittany is, um, is an activist. She's a filmmaker and she's also been uh, a protagonist in the film Whose Streets. And so Brittany comes to this with a really unique perspective when we think about care. Uh, and one of the things I think we don't talk about enough, Brittany, in our field, although I think we're getting better at it, is to talk about the care that we take um, to our protagonists and what that means both when the camera is running and then when the camera is not running. Um, yes. And what we as people of color, what our responsibilities are to our own communities in those contexts. So. I'd love for you to tell us about your current film and then we, we can watch a clip if you want to set that up. Okay, sure. Yes. Thank you, Carrie. Um, uh, I will also follow suit and I want to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Eleni people based here in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm very happy to be here with you all today. Um, yes, this is a very important topic, especially as we are in the middle of yet another national uprising due to police violence. Um, and, you know, one thing that, that comes up for me, because I'm currently working on a project that is documenting the experiences of Black pregnant people um, here in America. And um, it, for those who don't know, America is currently um, facing what I would consider to be three pandemics. We're dealing with uh, racism, um, deeply rooted sy systemic racism. Uh, we're dealing with the challenge of COVID-19. Um, we're also in a global crisis of maternal health. Um, the disparity here for Black women in this country, we die at three to four times the rate uh, as our white counterparts. And uh, what's, what's less talked about is how does the experiences of non-binary and trans folks fit into the narrative around birth? Um, and so I'm telling this story about a population um, that's already vulnerable to all three of those things that I just mentioned. Um, and so there is 
uh, it's a it's very delicate to come into to be in community um, with folks knowing that they're at risk for all three of the things that we're all fighting. Um, and so the type of care that must be taken into consideration, it's physical, it's uh, emotional, it's mental, it's spiritual, right? And so that means um, really grounding yourself in, in you know, solid principles of how you're engaging with folks. Um, is it about you getting the story that you want to tell and not fostering a relationship, um, not making folks who invite you into their lives and who trust you uh, with their stories and their bodies, um, and not building a relationship with them to continue to um, do simple things like check in. How can you how can you continue to amplify the work of protesters after after you're done following them and collecting their stories when when all the other cameras are gone? Um, what does it mean to really honor the trauma and the stress that Black folks are carrying? You know, and uh, being very familiar with that myself, I, I take a very um, I, I take a very unique approach in under, like taking time to truly understand um, the complexities of my subject's stories. Um, it's kind of the same practice that I embody as a nurse. You know, it's the individualized care. How am I showing up in that moment as a director, as a storyteller, but also as somebody of that community? Because uh, yours, one, one individual's circumstance or story around their pregnancy, around uh, the challenges that they're facing, being black and being pregnant, being at risk for COVID, dealing with the stress and traumas of bringing a black child into this world, not knowing how this society, how this world's gonna treat that child when we are still today in 2020 uh, fighting a back against police violence and state violence. You know, our children can easily become the victims of that. And so, um, wanting to take that and, and say, okay, this is more than just a story. You know, this story is very important because there are layers. There are layers that add to the circumstances in which Black folks are dealing with today, uh, so deeply systemic and pulling those back and also wanting to highlight the joys just as much as we highlight the challenges and also uh, wanting to continue to check in and foster a relationship around um, around how people are doing people's needs you know and so each subject that I have followed throughout my current project I still maintain communication with them I still check in to see how they're doing to see if they have any needs what community resources can I connect them to to make sure that they know that they're not alone. Uh, and I think that that's just the ethical practice of dealing with vulnerable populations, dealing with people um, who are already holding a lot, who um, may gracefully allow you into their lives to document their stories. How much did your, I mean, you come from it from, and, I, and the nurse part that I left out of your bio, which is completely relevant right now too. I mean, how much of your being both a nurse and then having participated in a film yourself are informing the way that you interact with the various individuals in your film? And I, to the degree that we can be specific as we kind of imagine, like if we were to come out with a manifesto at the end of this call, you know, what would be those specific things that we can do as we're taking care? I think it's really important to see how, um, and, and this is what nursing has taught me, the interconnectedness of all of our struggle. Um, and um, it, nothing is ever, ever a single, a single story, right? And so, um, so I, you know, I think about uh, in a clip that I'm getting rich, ready to show you, uh, one of the subjects in the clip, her name is Ayana. And uh, Ayana, you know, she's young, she's married. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to tell the story of her pregnancy with her fourth child. Um, and she opened up a lot to us, telling, her, telling us a lot about her life's experiences around um, struggles that she was dealing with in her marriage and uh, struggles with employment. She was currently unemployed at the moment. Um, lack of health care and how that's affecting her overall well-being she did not have a bed to sleep on you know like understanding like those very personal social economic struggles and how it all feeds into you know her you know where she's currently at right now in her life like 
that means that her, the way that I show up in her life is going to be a lot different than another subject that I might be following. That interconnectedness, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a responsibility to show up in a way that is unique and specific to meet the needs of Ayana. Well, and is Ayana going to be in the clip that you're about to show? Yes. Okay, so let's show the clip and then, um, and then we'll introduce Ashley O'Shea, our next guest. And then at the end, um, and once we've introduced all of our guests, we'll kind of bring everybody together and engage in a larger conversation. So let's view the clip. Hi, my name is Ayana Graham. I was calling to make an appointment with my OB, Dr. January. So Dr. January won't be back until June. Um, when in June will she be back? She'll be back June 4th. Okay. Um, my due date is June 16th. Uh, do you think I should be seen sooner? I haven't been um, back to, to be seen um, in about two months because my insurance was inactive. And now that it's active, do you think that it'll be best for me to be seen by a different doctor until Dr. January gets back in June? It's up to you. Okay, well, I'll take the June I'll take the June 4th appointment. What times do you have available? I am here today to see Ayana. She reached out some months ago just for like some support. Unfortunately, you know, there was some uh, issues with like insurance coverage and then once the insurance coverage got fixed, uh, the provider will not see Ayana for like five to six more weeks, which is a big problem. She's at the end of her pregnancy where at this time she should actually be seen every week. And there's already been some risks that have been presented. So I'm just like appalled that um, they're not going to see her sooner. So I'm here to once again step in as a community supporter and midwife to make sure that we check in on Ayana and baby to make sure they're safe and they're good until the hospital steps up and do their job and make room for black women who needs to be seen. So this is negative, which means you didn't eat. This is good, but you're all the way over here, Ayana. Oh, so that excited. means this is your specific gravity. So you're plus one, two, three, four, five, which means you're really, really close to being dehydrated. Huh? between like 120 and 130, which is normal, okay? All right, little baby. <laughs> So I want to introduce Ashley O'Shea. Ashley um, is a filmmaker and a cinematographer and is Chicago based. Um, and so Ashley, I would love for you to start and to first of all, tell us about Unapologetic. Um, and there's a thread that's going on here through this incredibly well curated um, set of discussions, which is about female activism and, and women being at the forefront of movements and making things happen as we know women do. So Ashley, please tell us about Unapologetic. And I think you're muted right now. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone. And I will also follow suit and acknowledge I'm on the land of the Kikapu, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, and two people here in Chicago. Um, and like many of the major cities experiencing unrest right now, um, we're experiencing that in Chicago. Um, and, you know, it takes me back to the moment in 2015 that I began the Unapologetic um, in the wake of uh, the police killing of Rakia Boyd and Laquan McDonald, two young people here in the city. Um, and that is the moment in which um, Unapologetic emerged. Um, and it emerged out of a moment also of not wanting to just focus on the movement as a whole, but 
on the young people in this movement, uh, the, the black women and the queer and the trans and the non-binary voices that were being centered in a way that I had never seen done before. Um, and me being a young black woman at the time, I knew that the way that it, it inspired me, that it was something that um, deserved a comprehensive media piece that went beyond the spectacle of the news cycle um, and the spectacle of protesting. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of surreal to see this, this moment come about, especially like on the precipice of the premiere of the film. But, um, you know, it also feels fitting because I think right now in this moment, we cannot afford to, to leave out the voices of black women and, and non-binary folks and trans folks. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a saying here in, in many other movement spaces that no one's free until we're all, until we're all free. Um, and so that's, that's something that I hope Unapologetic is able to illuminate. Um, yeah, maybe we could play the clip. That. <laughs> <laughs> let's try let's play the clip um and then okay. we'll talk more about what's happening now and also um what's happening with the film which which i think you just wrapped kind of on the precipice of covid so um yeah. play the clip Yes, Chicago, Illinois, where there's been a major development in the police shooting of 22-year-old African-American woman, Rakia Boyd. Watch it! Watch it! Watch it! While you are here! While you are here! Celebrating over brunch! Celebrating over brunch! Black families! Black families! Are struggling to keep themselves! Are struggling to keep themselves! No, we all have TV. We all watch the news. These are some of the names of black women killed by the police. Sierra Thomas, 30. Say her name. Shandra Reaver, 48. Say her name. India Cager, 48. Say her name. Sandra Bland, 28. Say her name. It's my mama up there styling on them. Yeah, my mama was in the federal penitentiary when she took that picture. Well, it was crazy, like they had picture days and shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was always told that my mom and dad loved me, but that's hard to process as a kid when you don't see them. It's my baby. I have a whole family here who I know needs protecting in a way that they've never been protected. Servant sitting in his car fired five shots over his shoulder Boyd was hit in the head from behind and killed. Printed a photo of my dad on campus at a rally that he had organized to get a police officer on campus fired. I paired it with a photo of me at a rally for Rakia Boyd talking about getting Dante Servin fired. Just a reminder of why I do this. I'm a doctoral student organizing towards black freedom. We are committed to confronting this war, city council, and the mayor until y'all fire Dante Serpent. You, you want to hate her? her? You want to hate her? You slam on me. It's very new, this idea of this being work. You feel me? Like, this has always been life. It was just like an exacerbated level of commitment. <laughs> but the narrative is definitely shifting and it's being more explicit about the value of women's work.
people. Um, and actually, you talked a lot about um, your relationship to the people that you're documenting and to the movements mm -hmm. that you're documenting too. And I think, you know, we always talk about in documentary, or we often do about the power structure that somehow we have all the power, which I actually kind of reject because that takes away agents from um, the people who agree to be in our films. Um, but, but, you know, that said, we make a lot of the decisions. And so I guess I'm wondering how you view that relationship between you and the, and the individuals and the movements that you're capturing. For sure. I mean, I think, I think uh, it, it may be taboo to say, but in reality, both of my main subjects are my friends. Like these are people that have grown to become family over the past few years. And, you know, I think because of, the relationship that we build outside of filmmaking that's what allowed us to have the intimacy that is being portrayed on screen um and you know for me i was coming at it uh as a black woman but i i was not somebody that had been deeply steeped in movement work prior to beginning production so um it was really important for me to um like move outside of the outside of the protest space in the public facing space um, to really just spend time with them and get to know them as people, um, you know, like traveling with one of my subjects to South Carolina and having dinner with her with her family and, and being taken around to the places she grew up. Um, I think that only I think I think oftentimes that scene is like taboo in the in the world of like objectivity and journalistic integrity but um for me like i knew the crux of this film was going to be i wanted it to feel like a black woman made it and so i think it would be doing it a disservice if i was to uh reject that notion or, or not lean into that uh for the sake of tradition i guess <laughs> and i think we should just say it's a falsehood um you know if journalists want to pretend that they don't engage in relationships with their sources they do absolutely um, that's a falsehood and we need to we need to stop perpetuating it sometimes they don't but you know sometimes they do sure. um and you know the last thing i wanted to just touch on before we introduce our next guest is um something that you talked about the other day about you know people kind of in this particular moment picking up their camera feeling empowered um to go out and capture what's happening um, but not necessarily with a lot of care or deliberation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think right now in this moment, there's a lot of aimless coverage going on. Um, I think a lot of people are attracted to the spectacle of this moment. And, you know, for better or worse, like this, this can be literally a portfolio builder for some people. Like I've seen amazing images and uh, video come out of this um, in a way that I appreciate, but I also think moving coming into it without intention it really um it, it might it like creates more chaos in the messaging um for me in chicago i've tried to be really intentional about only going out with my camera when i when there's a specific ask from me or an offering to someone else for me to to cover their action or event um because i think you know that invites partnership and understanding in a way that you don't always you aren't afforded when you just kind of show up and uh, film a lot of things. I also just think like the accumulation of footage without an intention is like, I just don't see the point. Like, I'm like, is it going towards the larger archive? Like, I, I think I learned a lot while filming Unapologetic. You can film a lot of stuff that has no purpose. And so I think, I, I just think in this moment, we can't necessarily afford that. And I, I think there's so many ways for people to be involved. Like. Maybe you're a photographer, but your best your best uh, offering right now is how you can help communication strategy or help mutual aid funds. Um, I think I think people really need to investigate like what can they bring to this moment um, because because we there's enough I mean, I mean especially white folks like there there are enough white documenters so we we need people in other ways right now. Well, that's a great note to, to kind of move in and introduce Nosheen, but um, I do want to come back, Ashley, um, as we do the larger conversation and make sure that we talk about what's going to happen to Unapologetic um, okay. and when it will premiere and all of that. So I don't want to lose that thread, but I definitely want to get Nosheen into the conversation as well. Uh, so I want to introduce Nosheen. Are you there? Hi. Hi, Nushi. So I want to introduce Nushin Dadaboy. 
And uh, Noshin is also a cinematographer and a filmmaker um, and has been working on a film about uh, another group of incredible women activists in the Muslim community, Active Worship. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing both Ashley and Oshin's films evolve over time. Um, and in some ways they're like, this is an incredible moment to be talking about this work. The chaos in downtown Oklahoma City did indeed resemble Beirut after what police believed to be a 1,200 pound car bomb. I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims around the world. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. I feel like much of my life has been spent forming my identity and my relationship with myself as a Muslim, as a woman, as a minority in this country. As much as we want to be Muslim and American, Americans, whatever definition you want to have of that, don't see us as American. My experiences already growing up as someone visibly Muslim in the United States, I never really felt American. So I guess the question is, what does it mean to be Muslim? And if that's incompatible with the United States, so be it. It takes a toll to struggle just because of who I am. It hurts me deeply. It's a wound that I've been trying to cover up. So how the heck do I expect to go out there and be strong and fake it? I'm tired of faking it. It's still very much a work in progress right now. Um, I, you know, I think I definitely feel like it's relevant to this conversation, but I do feel like today like I'm really here as like a DP and to like advocate for like below the line folks um but the film I think Ashley also like put it way more eloquently and so did Brittany in terms of like you know how we film within our own communities how we build partnership with people that we're filming um and I think you know we we were talking a little bit about like agency and how we you know like even for for this project you know a lot of like people came out for the protests around the Muslim ban and it was like, oh my God, what's happening with the Muslim community? And it's like, what's been happening to the Muslim community for the last 20 years? And I would argue for the last 30 years, there's been like, you know, um, targeted policy against our community for that long. And it wasn't Trump and it wasn't suddenly like, oh my God, this is happening. And our film is really trying to like expand on that and be like, forget Trump. Like this has been an ongoing story. And it's really, as Ashley said, it's not just like covering the protests, but really like, you know, getting intimate with our characters and our subjects. And also we have so many shared experiences that it's really like, you know, that's how we're able to I think enrich their story too because it's like I'm not suddenly asking them to like talk about trauma it's like really shared trauma that we're both like uncovering at the same time right right and I and I um I you know I want to give you a plug because this it is an important film and it is of the moment but you do have some really pointed things to say about as a cinematographer um who really depends on going out there and being out in the field and the complexity of this moment both from a COVID perspective, um, from maybe some ethical decisions that you have to make about what work you will or will not take. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what you're facing as a cinematographer right now. I mean, I think um, one of the things that it's interesting, like we've been in converse, I've, I'm actually working with another, with a group of DPs and we're trying to like organize ourselves um, just to have like, here's best practices from our perspective and just open up that conversation. And one of the things that's interesting is, and, and of course it points to a larger problem within the documentary community about like, um, you know, uh, sustainability. Cause sometimes like I'm getting paid because, and the director's not paying themselves and like I'm doing 
doing that. Like sometimes I'm not paying myself and I'm paying somebody else to do something for me. But like, just because you're getting paid doesn't mean you're getting taken care of. And, you know, as a DP or as a sound person, like as below the line folks, we really put our like care into the hands of the production. And sometimes it's small things like, there's no food and like anybody that works with me knows that like I will go nuts if like <laughs> there's no food and water on set. Um, but like sometimes there's no schedule and there's no like shot list and we're like, what are we doing today? And sometimes it's like really, you know, it's much more serious than that. And you're like, life is on the line. And like, I've been in situations where like, gunshots are going off and I can't find a director or producer to like get me out of that space, you know? So like literally our, her like lives are sometimes in your hands. And it's also such a disconnect when often we're working about films about social justice and like you're being completely abused in that process. Um, and often you have to like swallow a lot of these things because you're like, I can't like, I don't wanna burn this bridge. I'm worried about this relationship. Am I gonna get more work? And so, you know, ev everything is sort of like buried and you're not sharing what, you know, you're all going through. Um, and I think right now, in terms of like the pandemic, you know, so many of us are, are out of work and wouldn't be able to sustain ourselves at all if it wasn't for the CARES Act. Um, sorry, now my parents' <laughs> phone is going up. <laughs> You're like, okay, stop. <laughs> stop the camera. <laughs> The ambient noise is part of our new life. It's new <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, like without the CARES Act, like we would have no way to sustain ourselves because we're, you know, like we can't be out in the field. And now like people are jumping at, back into work. There's these guidelines coming out and it starts to feel like, oh, maybe there's a roadmap. Maybe there's a way for us to be, um, you know, like safely getting back into work. But I think that a lot of us are more doing like, more kind of feeling like pressured like we have to go back into work you know we're like how long is unemployment gonna last like if you know people are going back in like am i is it gonna be harmful for me if i'm not accepting those calls right now and i think you know even just like last week i was like maybe i'm gonna accept this job when i'm really not not feeling ready to do it and i'm not touching on like the the uprising part of it because obviously there are people that are going out to document that and have been but like um I think this is like the most dangerous time for any of us to be out there and working and we really I think need the documentary community to also be thinking about how are creative ways where we can care for our subjects but also care for our crew and think about like maybe we don't fall back to like intimate verite like something is happening you know like I started my film that way too like there were protests at the airport and I was like, shit, this is happening. I got to go film this. But like, why we need to, I think, like really step back and like really think about planning, really think about like creative ways where we can approach filmmaking right now. And I've been working on a film remotely since April. And I know that's not for everyone. Like not everyone. I, I certainly don't want to become like a Zoom. <laughs> you know, like that's not why I went to, into tons of film school debt, but like, I also want to make sure that I'm safe and I want to make sure that my family's safe and we still haven't even figured out liability and insurance and like there's so many things that we're still figuring out. So, you know, I really like, I really want people to start thinking about like, how can we expand creative ways to, to be approaching the work right now? Um, because it is important and we do have to be covering it. But then like, you know, if it's like, okay, well, it has to be, it has to be Verite, it has to be now, like, I also think like it's important to consider like who is actually filming right now mm -hmm. who can afford to be filming right now there's going to be a lot of costs that come up with like do we have to provide COVID testing do we have to provide housing for people or even even separate Ubers like that's expensive like my film couldn't probably afford that so how who is going to be able to continue like filming um and I think like it's important to think about that from the perspective of like, you know, like people of color, but especially women of color who hire me more and are definitely more marginalized in the space. And who's going to be able to, you know, like who's going to kind of be like pushed out, I think, um, 
And, you know, I, I think that just talks more in terms of like long term of like, how can we continue as a community to like take care of each other and make sure that we're still here, you know, I don't know, 10 years from now. And like, a lot of people are like, oh, well, everyone wants to hire a black or POC filmmaker right now. But like, you're literally throwing our bodies into like harm's way right now. So I don't know that th this to me is not like a golden opportunity. We really should be thinking about like, one, why, why are you struggling to find like POC filmmakers? Like Firelight has existed for 10 years. And if we really had equity, like we would be in that room so that you weren't like, oh, where are the POC filmmakers? They're in the room making these decisions with us. Right. And by the way, if, if anybody's wondering where the POC filmmakers are, Brown Girls Doc Mafia just published a huge database of, I think, uh, several hundred POC filmmakers. So you can find many there. But I think you're right. I think the, the fear of what's about to happen in terms, we already have um, a system that's not equitable, that is not inclusive. And I, I fear too that it's going to get worse. And you can already see, um, you know, that some people do have the capacity and the support and the resources to be out there, you know, as safe as they can be. And by the way, there's no such thing. Like this is not, there's no such thing. And even if you're safe and even if your subject's safe, like what is our responsibility to the larger community? You know, what is the resp our responsibility to the person at the grocery store or to the person at the pharmacy or to our grandparents or to our children or to our, our frontline medical workers? So, I mean, I, this is so complicated. And so I think everything you just said everybody needs to be asking themselves and do I need to do this and to what end and how deliberate can I be? I um, mean, sometimes I think the story does, does merit it, right? We have to take some risks. You have taken some big risks in, in your career to get a story, um, but sometimes um, it maybe is more beneficial to us than to the actual story. So I think, you know, we really have to think deeply. Um, okay, I'm going to introduce V now, and then we'll bring you back shortly, Noshin. So thank you for that. And I really hope that everybody kind of takes all of that in, including the food, the food part. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most important. Same way. Yeah, exactly. Hi, V. How are you? Hey, everybody. Thank you for having me. So V is a, a longtime visual artist and filmmaker um, who has documented youth culture, hip hop culture, politics um, throughout his career, and also is an expert um, impact and outreach producer. Um, and so I actually, this is not the subject of our, of our conversation, but I, I, I hope we can squeeze some of that impact part in because it's top of mind for a lot of filmmakers. So V, you, um, you know, one of the reasons that um, I thought I could bring you on at this point is that you've been documenting um, a, a historic uprising already in Chile um, and also a woman-led um, uprising which is amazing to see and I think the thing that's incredible about all of your work is that women have always been part of big social movements we know that but we haven't always been portrayed as such um, often kind of like a, sen a second narrative or, or you know the right hand person right is how women have been portrayed in social movements at times um, so can you set up your work? I don't know if we're going to try, do, are we trying to show the trailer or what do you want to do, V? <laughs> um, we can try. If it doesn't work, we can stop it right away and I put the link on um, the chat. So okay. you want to give it a shot? Let's give it a shot. en un contexto de revuelta en este país. Chile tiene asimetrías en, en torno a los ingresos y desigualdades profundas. Entonces hubo un llamado eh, a elevación. Eh, organizamos una asamblea abierta de estudiantes secundarios a la que llegaron 17 estudiantes de toda la ciudad. ese estallido que fue protagonizado por jóvenes fue seguido y secundado por otras personas fue como un no se puede más el trato con el pueblo es indigno no, el, el gobierno y la clase social alta no tiene empatía con nosotros para ellos somos rotos somos flojos porque estamos exigiendo nuestros derechos vino el famoso llamado del señor presidente a los militares ¿no? Se han cometido sistemáticos crímenes de lesa humanidad. Mucha 
nuestras compañeras que han sido abusadas, torturadas, violadas y asesinadas dentro del último mes. Cuando yo escuché el término guerra, esto cambió de color. Obviously, you've kind of been mired in, in all of this and in thinking about all of these things for a while now. And um, based on our conversation the other day, I would just love to hear how you're processing this moment and um, structurally really thinking about, you know, who should be capturing these stories and what care does need to be taken. What are, you know, what are the ethical questions people need to be asking? Um, sure. So, um how I got immersed into this process was that I'm a political exile and please mind the construction happening outside my apartment. I live in New York. Um, and um, I, you know, I was born in 1973. So my family fled Chile uh, because of the dictatorship. And then when things jumped off in Chile in October, 2019, I just had a conversation with myself, uh, with some people on the ground. And we just asked ourselves, are we gonna like let this happen again? We remember that in 73, Pinochet uh, murdered a journalist. Uh, there was hardly any coverage. And I think uh, we decided to just step into that moment. Um, and in doing so, we came across all the political media actors in Chile, uh, including many women who were beginning to document uh, what was happening in early October. Um, and then we quickly assembled a working coalition of um, US-based Chileans with Chileans from Chile and uh, initially just went to Chile to just document stuff. Like I didn't have an idea for a documentary film. The impetus was like, let's get the coverage of everything that is happening on the ground. People who have been killed, victimized, and also begin to tell the story of everybody who was on the front lines leading the resistance. And, you know, but then when I came back home with all that footage, I realized that I had something of a film. Uh, went back again in March. Um, and then got on the last plane before Chile shut down uh, wow. borders, came back to the U.S. on March 15 into quarantine, and I'm still suffering from PTSD because on March 9th, I was, uh, I was in the company of two million Chileans at the Women's March, <laughs> and then had to come home and quarantine myself for 30 days, and <laughs> which is nuts. <laughs> Right, right. And there is this, you know, cognitive dissonance happening of us all knowing and understanding that this virus is real and that um, it's dangerous to our communities. And yet we're out in the streets um, because we have to be. Um, but that risk that's being taken, um, talk a little bit about that, about the risks overall and, you know, the ways in which we are or are not supported um, in facing those risks. Um, sure, it's a great question. And, you know, I just want to preface that what I'm experiencing is, is, is what I'm experiencing. I don't want to project onto everyone here that the choices that I've made, I chose to make are choices that everyone should be making. Um, I willingly made the choice to go to Chile and put my life at risk 
because I felt that I needed to because I saw myself as an agent in history um, at that moment. Um, but then when I came back to the States and, um, you know, the incidents uh, following the murder of George Floyd began to surface in Minneapolis, uh, I vividly remember uh, the first night in New York City when things jumped off in Fort Greene and I saw the image of the police van on fire. And I had a conversation with myself, do I go out? Do I break my quarantine, right? Um, and I chose to go outside with a camera and begin to document things. Uh, because at that moment, I, I could not disconnect sort of like the global historic right. moment that right. I was living in. Um, and you know, a lot of people say, hey, you gotta step into the moment. Um, and uh, I felt like that's what I needed to do. Um, and then since then, you know, I've been getting a lot of support from uh, my friends in Chile who have gone through, mm -hmm. you know, 137 days of protest uh, with a COVID framework and just relying on them to support me and, uh, and then sharing that information with our colleagues on the street here and everyone on the street. Um, but it's an intentional choice that I had to make. Um, I did go get tested. Uh, three days ago because I don't want to put anyone at risk, including my family. Um, but, um, and you know, the other thing is that you, you do have to make that choice. Uh, going onto the street, you know, I realize I may get the virus. I may give it to someone else. Uh, the best thing that you can do is take care of yourself, take the precaution. Um, but at some moment, you just have it in you. It just, just, that, that fire, is, nothing's going to stop you, you know. Um, and I guess I'm stupid and crazy enough to, to just get involved. <laughs> I think we might all be in that same boat, actually. Of, of <laughs> not the stupidity, but the, you know, the, 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 what we, that's why we do this work, right? And so uh, as things are unfolding, um, I don't know if it was you or I can't remember who said it, but somebody said, you know, if you wouldn't be out there as a protester, you shouldn't be out there as a filmmaker on our call the other day. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering where you where you um, straddle that line, and then we'll bring up you know all our panelists for the Q and A. Sure. So um, I am moving within the space as an activist and tactician, um, filmmaker third, um, mm -hmm. and I say that because in talking about the ethics of shooting on the ground, when I go out into the street, first I see my people. I see my community, right? And then there are relationships that are evolving on the street. And I do wanna say that, and I wanna say this, <laughs> that everything that we've achieved in the past 14 days, no politician has able to achieve in the last two generations. The, the freedom and the, the gains and the wins that we've achieved have been fought on the street. And because of that, I think, I look at my role there as a educator, tactician, a friend, an uncle, and every day you have to think about how you intervene or sometimes how you don't intervene and step out of the way. Um, and in doing that, I've witnessed a lot of incredible things, some of which are ugly, uh, some of which are very, give me a sense of hope and optimism. Um, but, you know, I, I don't go in there as a storyteller. I'm going there as a friend of the community that hopefully will share the story with the rest of the world. But like, if I don't get the shot on a certain day, I'm cool with it. You know, I'm okay with it. Um, I, I detest when I see white filmmakers lining up to get that shot. They smell the blood. They, they smell that the cops are coming and don't have a regard for people in the community. Um, and then at that moment, I turn into educator, right? Right, yeah. um, right. So it's an ongoing pro process. I, I don't have the answers. Uh, I, I welcome everyone's help. I've never experienced this in my life and straddling between two social movements. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. I'll pause. <laughs> right. And, 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 you know, it is and it. What happened in two and a half weeks also is part of a sustained movement, right? A sustained movement of organizers and labor and work that's been happening and storytellers and activists, you know, all of it over, you know, a number of, of years and decades. Um, and so, but it's an amazing, amazing moment. And it does harken back to when there was a time of global unrest in the 60s, you know, around the world of people really demanding that things change. Um, and we're seeing that right now. Um, 
the difference being that we also have this global pandemic hanging over all of us. Um, so I would love to bring in uh, all of our panelists and Loida, uh, who's going to, I think, help us um, moderate the questions in the chat. Um, feel free to turn your cameras on and, and join us. And we'll get the questions going. And I will, at some point, I might pass the torch um, to Loida um, because I am doing another conversation. And but when Firelight asks me um, or invites me to do anything, um, I will always say yes and uh, and make it a priority for sure. So, um, Loida, I'm not sure. Are we doing? Um, do I look at the Q and A or? Let me, yes. Let me pull this up. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is a great question. Someone um, anonymously is asking about the ethics of accepting work to cover POC communities and protests. Um, and so if you are, you know, a cinematographer or um, a sound recordist, you know, you might be asked to go and document something for a white filmmaker. Um, and, uh, and then you have to make the decision about you know, are you going to go and do that work, right? Because because we all need to work, and what are the implications of that? How do you make those decisions? And Nusheen, Ashley, I mean, any any of you can can respond to that. <laughs> uh, no, see, oh, go ahead. You got it. No, no. <laughs> um, I think that that that's something that's. Of course, it's happening right now, but I think it's always something that I feel like I'm dealing with in my work and also why I decided to direct this movie myself, because um, a lot of, you know, a lot of my work is like white filmmakers who are then using my body to literally like say like, oh, we'll put those people in front of the camera at ease because you're, you're going to be there. And, you know, and that is kind of like permission to then like, they're just checking off a box. And like, I, um, I don't have any sort of agency in terms of like pushing that creative. Of course, I have power with how, where my camera is pointing and what I'm capturing. But at the end of the day, I hand off that footage. And I have, you know, I'm lucky now that maybe I can make uh, decisions that aren't just based, based on my pocketbook, but certainly, you know, before it was like, I got to pay rent, I get, you know, I, I yeah. need to take this work, I need to get the experience, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it is, it is really hard. And I don't think we can, I'm, I'm not sitting in judgment of anybody, whether they do it or not. But I think like, now I'm really um, cognizant of like, who's reaching out to me, why I feel like they're reaching out to me. And also like, a lot of times people will reach out to me and be like, well, you're not white. So, and, but like, this is a black community or this is an indigenous community. And so I'm also making sure that I have a roster of other people that I can be like, maybe you should ask this other filmmaker who is part of that community or who will have like a better understanding than I do. And if I can, I, you know, I'm going to pass that along. Ashley, did you want to add to that? Yeah, just briefly. I mean, like Nosheen said, I don't think there's a hard and fast uh, rule for it in this moment. Um, but for me, it's really all about intention. Um, you know, I, I think there's sometimes a, an expectation in the white community that, you know, Black and POC filmmakers, like, of course, we're already out. Like, a lot of the requests I feel like I've gotten have been like, oh, of course, you're already out filming the protest because you're a Black DP. Um, and not considering, you know, what risk and, and uh, how I may be considering my own safety in that. Um, so, and, and in general, I just, I don't know, I just have a really hard time uh, with the, with intention and in, in white, <laughs> white directors when it comes to, to our stories. I think, I think there's, like Nosheen said, like, if I don't have a creative stake in it, um, it, it almost feels like I'm just perpetuating that, that same spectacle of, like, the viewer and the viewed. Um, so for me, I, it's really important to, to understand their intention and understand uh, what creative stake I might have in it. Right, and I wanted um, Brittany to talk a little bit about, you know, we talked a little bit about literally when you're um, filming, like the sensitivity and care when you're filming bodies, physical bodies. Mm -hmm. um, and so can you talk a little bit about how you're approaching that? Uh, yes. So I think that there's something to be said about the way 
um, black stories are told through the eyes of black people. Um, same goes for people of color, how those stories are told through their eyes. I think there's a totally different kind of relationship to that. For example, uh, directing my current project, I know that there is a, a lot of distrust um, in the Black community with providers. Um, and so I know that it doesn't really mean anything if you are even a Black provider. It's like you're still an agent, right, of the same system that has that has perpetuated harm against Black bodies for generations. And so um, as a, both a, a Black practitioner, you know, a medical professional, um, and also a director, it, you know, I understand that with that type of mistrust, and it's very, um, you know, it's well understood why, uh, I understand that there's extra effort and intention um, in the type of approach that I have with folks and how I talk to them about their bodies and the type of agency that I give them on what do they want to share? How do they want me to capture them? You know, um, what is it that you want me to make sure that I mention and making sure that their voice is threaded throughout every scene? Thank you. I, I wanna toss this one to you, V. Somebody asks about, um, you know, talk about using cell phones to capture your stories. In other words, you know, don't wait for the expensive equipment to become available, use what you have at hand. And actually, V, you brought this up the other day, the way that, you know, the, the systemic realities, the economic realities that make it hard for us as filmmakers of color to like access equipment and to get our own gear or to get the insurance. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, sure, I mean, all of us have a cell phone. Uh, pretty much some of them are all shooting in 4K quality these days, at least the expensive ones. I'm not gonna name drop them and give them free advertisement. Um, <laughs> but I think also um, you, you need to have a level of training also in, in, in how to frame your shot, how to do tracking shots. Um, I think that's important too. Um, so I think uh, the, the cell phone gives you more coverage, more cover, I should say from police uh, because when you are shooting police up and close um, and you have a lens on your camera that becomes a threatening tool um, and they'll respond quicker to that um, i think most police officers uh, are okay with like seeing a phone in a hand a camera feels a little more threatening um, so i would say you know practice you know your your framing um, and, and and the phone can can work um, so yes, I hope that answers the question. Um, there's a question, I think, which is a really good and practical one, which we, we really want to talk about this stuff, which is about hazard pay. So Nosheen um, and Ashley, do you have any thoughts about hazard pay? Are people offering it? Are they refusing it? Is it even possible right now? What is the, the state of play at the moment? I know that um, some like outlets are offering it. Um, I know I'm asking for it. I think we should all be asking for it. Um, but it, again, it comes down to like who can afford it. And that is always, you know, marginalizing a certain subset of filmmakers. Um, but I think even to me, like more than that is it's like how much thought and care and planning are you putting into, you know, hiring? So if you come to me, do you have like a schedule for the day and you have some sort of COVID protocol already or like protest protocol? Like, you know, I, if you have that, then at least I'm like, here's somebody that's thought this through and that cares about my well being. Um, you know, but yeah, we should all be getting hazard pay. Someone else is asking about um, hostile environment training and whether or not, you know, people are. Um, are offering it to keep people safe you know do you guys have it does anybody here have have you had hostile environment training um you know no no one's had it trial by fire yeah i've um i learned hostile environment training in the streets of chile um where um the, the first line of defense is called primera linea and that is a group of um just volunteers that protect the peaceful protesters um, and that's where I learned 
how to um, neutralize tear gas. I learned uh, tactical self-defense when the cops do come at you, go for the legs. I learned how to run in pairs. So if the cops do come, you never turn your back on the cops. You always run in pairs. Uh, I learned how to use shields to protect your vision. Um, also learned how to communicate um, using hand signals, right? If, if, if your, um, your phone dies. Uh, but like someone said, you, you, you learn on the ground. Uh, I'm in the process right now working with some friends in Chile to make a tactical training video that we can share with our colleagues here. Um, but just to give you a sense of how crazy the situation is in Chile, the group that was going to record the demo video yesterday got arrested by the military. Um, that's just how serious it is because they had to break the COVID curfew to show up to the next spot. Luckily, we got a team of attorneys to get them out uh, and they were all released around 9 p.m. last night. So just to, just a, a couple things that I'll throw in here because this is the thing that makes me as a journalist and as a, you know, a former a uh, senior producer who sends teams out makes me nervous. Um, the International Documentary Association with Witness, which is a, a human rights organization, um, we did put out a list of resources last week, um, and maybe I can figure out a way to share those in the chat, including things like, you know, how do you prepare yourself if you're confronted with tear gas? Um, you know, what are the, like literally some of the tools that you need to stay safe. Um, a colleague of mine who was in Iraq reminded me the other day that the most important thing is your head and your eyes. Um, so these are the types of things that actually hostile environment training is very helpful with. Um, staying on the periphery, you know, if you do have a lot of gear, you know, things like that. They're just um, uh, ways, being in teams, like not being out there alone, so that you can all be watching each other and each other's backs um, if things get out of control. So. Um, take a look at those resources. I'll try to find a way to share those. If not now, um, you know, we can put them out on social media. But I do worry a lot about that and about your physical safety. And that's, that's the fund that I run is actually intended to support filmmakers doing high risk work with some of these issues, including that if, if in a newsroom you send someone out, you, you actually have the lawyers lined up and ready. So, you know, all of those things. Um, so let me just do one, we're gonna uh, wrap up soon um, and make sure that we got, you know, one more question in. I guess uh, to me, um, I just wanna do a round robin. And if there's one thing that you can say to POC filmmakers right now about what you want them to know, what you want them to do, why don't we quickly do that? And then I'll, I'll um, hand over to Loida. And I'll start, why don't we start with you, um, Brittany? One thing that I want um, people of color and black filmmakers to know is that if you find a story that's on your heart, don't be afraid to tell that story. When I first started recording You Lucky You Got a Mama, I had to use my iPhone until I had the, secured the equipment necessary to actually uh, film. So if, if the story is calling you, follow that. Thank you, Brittany. Ashley. I guess uh, one thing to share would be to just, you know, be cognizant of your community right now, um, which I, I think we're doing by, by nature. But uh, I, like I said, I think there's, there's room for everybody in this movement in the way that they need to show up. Um, so don't be afraid to communicate with folks on the ground. Don't be afraid to shamelessly volunteer, whatever it may be. I, I found like the most pivotal, most poignant stories just come from talking to people and not, sometimes it's just, it's okay to show up to a march or a rally without your camera and just talk to people um, because, you know, building that community aspect is just as important. Thank you, Ashley. Does Unapologetic have a premiere? <laughs> it has a premiere, I can't say where yet, but it, it will be coming, um, in late summer um, digitally. So yeah, if you follow us at unapologetic.doc, um, you will hear from us soon. Great, congratulations. Nishi, Thank you. Final thought. Uh, I think I just want everyone, like, you know, if people that are getting asked for work right now, just like, you know, for, put yourself first, put your family first and, you know, th th these opportunities will come back and you'll have other opportunities, but like first take care of yourself and, um, you know, and just make sure that if you are going out there, like really 
think about who your collaborators are. Think about if this is really important and if, you know, it's worth all those risks. And, um, you know, I've told everyone on Brown Girls this and it's uh, I'm available to all POC filmmakers. If you want to talk things through, like you can reach out to me and we can talk through if it's a good situation or not. Thank you. That's really generous. And thank you for that. And V. Uh, to all the filmmakers of color who are out on the streets right now, uh, don't waste your time having to, feeling like you have to explain to white people what's going on. That is time that can be spent fostering and strengthening our community. Uh, I need your help, right? So when we're out on the street and we meet each other, like I'm going through PTSD, like let's talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I'll share about that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that's an important point in general in whatever, whatever organizations, institutions, whatever we do in our, in our world, like we've done all the work, we know what's wrong. Um, so please help lift that from our communities <laughs> and just start to take care of business, right? Um, so I wanna bring back Loida, I wanna thank you all. I'm so inspired and I'm you know, happy to meet some of you digitally in this space and um, wishing you all the best. Thank you for including me, Firelight. And thank you, Firelight, for your leadership right now. We really, really appreciate it and, and honor that. And uh, with that, I'm going to pass it to Loida. Thank you all so much, Carrie, V, Nasheen, Ashley, Brittany. I appreciate y'all immensely. Um, I know these are complicated and layered and delicate conversations, so I appreciate y'all's transparency. Um, you know, I have a, a couple of thoughts uh, before we completely close out. Um, and one of them is that most of the Black, Indigenous, POC filmmakers that I know who are activists and who have made films about movements or activism don't actually want to be on the street right now. I just want to like shout that back. I know V is out on the street. V is one voice. We felt that that was important. But I just want to sort of say like that my the anecdotal evidence, because obviously at Firelight, we're getting tons of requests. People are asking us, who's this, who's that, who's on the ground? And overwhelmingly, the response, particularly from Black filmmakers, is that they don't want to be out there documenting the spectacle, the, the you know, the, the Black pain that we are sort of oversaturated by. Um, so that's something for us to like sit with collectively. That says something. These are people that are activists, that are filmmakers, that have made films or are making films about activism in their communities, and they do not want to be out there, <laughs> um, which is telling. So I just wanted to say that. I also want to lift up the fact that Stanley Nelson, our co-founder, has made a whole career out of making films about movements, um, black movements in this country, and he was never on any front line of anything. <laughs> um, so there's also that, you know, to to think about, like the news footage is gonna be out there. You know, you could always license that stuff, you know, later down the line when you have actually figured out what your story might be, you know, um, to, you know, to Ashley's point about aimless shooting. And then I think in terms of people that are deciding to go out um, and document what's happening on the streets. And I do think there are very valid reasons and to do that um, and to do that from um, a multitude of, of, from a multitude of perspectives. The, the piece that um, Carrie said uh, around, um, you know, if you wouldn't be out there as a protester, you shouldn't be out there as a filmmaker. That was actually, I said that on our prep call, but it was actually something that my good friend, Ill Weaver, from the Detroit Narrative Agency said to me as they and I were trying to figure out like how to hold up this contradiction of this COVID-19 uprising, what's the role of the filmmaker moment. And part of you know what they said was like, well, maybe th actually the COVID-19 guidelines apply to the uprising. Like you should only be mixing with the people that you would already be mixing with, right? So if you're 22 and you would be, out on the front line of the protest, then yeah, by all means, go ahead and document the front line of the protest because you're showing up, as we said, as first a community member, as an educator, as an activist, as a, you know, whatever, and last as a filmmaker. We don't need more filmmakers that are going to sort of be focusing on their, their safety, you know, 
primarily foremost and the shot. That's not, you know, and that's me, Loira, saying that. I don't know if anyone else agrees um, on this panel, but I think that there is actually a way in which the COVID-19 guidelines might actually apply um, to the, the documentation of the uprising and best practices for that. Um, and the last piece that I'll say is that I, I think there are a number of people, and there were some questions we didn't get to answer them all, asking about you know, best practices, advice for producers that do want to hire Black folks right now, that want to hire Indigenous folks, POC folks. Um, you know, wh how do we do this, right? Um, and it's interesting because COVID-19, what it asked us to do collectively was to stop, slow down, and center care. Like that's all, you know, all of a sudden those, those, that's what all of our conversations were about. And right now with the uprising, it's, it's sort of in the documentary field, I mean, in many communities, the conversation is about rushing to do. Um, and in this rush, we're causing harm. Um, so part of what I would say as advice to white producers or white, you know, executives that are rustling with how to show up and what to do in this moment is perhaps to slow down, listen, develop some relationships. Otherwise, your, your gestures, you know, and your actions will come off as naked opportunism in this moment. Um, so those are my sort of closing thoughts on, on, on this conversation. And I do want to say um, we thank you for joining us and we uh, ask you to consider joining us again next week. Uh, next week uh, will be, this conversation will fall on Juneteenth. Uh, the Movement for Black Lives has put out a national call to action. Firelight is joining that call with a panel conversation um, that will center Black filmmakers, the history of Juneteenth. We're also going to focus on Tulsa because Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, you know, will also be the site of 45's first rally. Right, and he chose Tulsa, uh, which is the site of you know a horrific incident, the burning down of Black Wall Street, uh, to have his first rally on Juneteenth, Emancipa Emancipation Day in the United States. Um, so we're far from from over, right? Even though things might feel like they're kind of quieting down, um, that's clearly an escalation on 45's part. Yes, terrorism, exactly right it's it's white terror call it what it is um and so we are going to be talking with black filmmakers about tulsa about juneteenth um and about black stories so we ask that you consider joining us again and um my last plug oh and i will say naked opportunism is actually a phrase that cecilia aldarondo said and that now i'm saying in every conversation henceforth because it is so appropriate for both COVID-19 and the uprising uh, conversations that we're having. My last plug is um, that uh, Firelight's Documentary Lab currently is accepting applications in our open call. Um, this is a fellowship program for uh, first, uh, first and second time filmmakers of color from across communities, right? So African-American, Latinx, um, Asian-American, Native American, Indigenous, like the whole sort of everybody that ain't white in this country basically <laughs> um, can apply uh, 18 months of mentorship, support, funding, and the deadline for applications is June 22nd. So, um, you know, if, if you are eligible, uh, we encourage you to apply or to share with others that might be eligible um, to join us. So with that, I will close. Thank you again to our panelists. You are fabulous. Um, appreciate you all. Uh, stay well and stay safe, everyone. Thank you, Violet. The, the ice cream truck came back. <laughs> <laughs> they never stopped, yo. They, they didn't give COVID-19 a break. Not in the Bronx. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank, Thank you. you.